All right. Um, so good morning, y'all. My name is Ashley Buchanan. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a second year divinity student at Vanderbilt Divinity School here in Nashville. Um, I'm born and raised in Nashville. Um, I went to college at TCU for four years, only time I've been away. Um, and I'm super passionate about um, prison reform and restorative justice, which is why I'm getting to speak with y'all about this this morning. Um, that being said, I am still a student. I am still learning and discovering what restorative justice looks like and can look like. So I am not a full-blown expert. Um, I do have experience. I took a class this summer on the on restorative justice through the Peace Building Institute at Eastern Mennonite University. Um, my concentration is in prison and carceral studies through BDS. So I've been inside prison. Some of my coursework has been, um, I've taken two classes on Tennessee's death row unit at Riverbend Maximum Security Institute. Um, that is where I learned really what restorative justice was um, and what it could look like and how um, whole it is. Um, yes, so if you have any questions throughout this presentation, I will be happy to answer them. Um, if you want to drop them in the, in the chat, um, just because I will be presenting and whatnot, and so I might not um, see your hand raised, <laughs> and I'll get to them at some point, I promise. Also, if I don't know the full answer to your question, I will ask you in a private message to send me your email so that um, as I learn and I do research or think about it, I can respond to you in a, in a full whole manner and so that we can continue conversation. Um, so that being said, um, I wanna start with a centering moment of sorts. I think it's really important to um, kind of give ourselves time to truly come in and focus on what we're doing. Um, so if you don't mind, if you would just close your eyes and sit comfortably, I am going to um, read a poem by a um, Thich Nhat Hanh, who is a um, monk, and I'm going to read through it twice. Um, and it talks about breathing. So when it says to breathe in, um, obviously take a deep breath in. And when it says to breathe out, do so and keep that breathing going throughout this. So. Join me in a moment of centering. Breathing in. Breathing out. Breathing in. Breathing out. I am blooming as a flower. I am fresh as the dew. I am solid as a mountain. I am firm as the earth. I am free. Breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. I am water reflecting what is real, what is true. And I feel there is space deep inside of me. I am free. I am free. I am free. Breathing in. Breathing out. Breathing in. Breathing out. I am blooming as a flower. I am fresh as the dew. I am solid as a mountain. I am firm as the earth. I am free. Breathing in. Breathing out. Breathing in breathing out. I am water reflecting 
what is real, what is true. And I feel there is space deep inside of me. I am free. I am free. I am free. So you're invited back into this space and, and you can open your eyes and we are about to start our presentation. Um, but I wanted to name a couple of things first is um, we'll be watching a couple short videos. Um, at the end, I'll name some resources that I've learned through professors and just reading on my own through coursework and whatnot and that have been really helpful in gaining a um, brief understanding of restorative justice and places to kind of start. Um, and again, I'll put my email in the chat at the end if you have any um, questions two weeks from now, tomorrow, in three hours, whenever. Um, I really want to continue dialogue because restorative justice is super important and it doesn't only matter in the justice system, in the criminal justice system. It is something that um, can be a whole um, society change and that would actually help improve its um, efficiency within the justice system. So if we learn to bring practices and processes like I will be talking about into our daily life and how we deal with conflict, um, it can actually be beneficial for society as a whole. So that being said, I'm going to share my screen. And all right, so let's get started. Um, so behavior. It is best accomplished through cooperative processes that allow willing stakeholders to meet. Although other approaches are available when that is impossible. This can lead to transformation of people, relationships, and communities. So this being said, um, our traditional justice system, what we've seen in the past in, in America is um, Crime is a deeply embedded social problem and policies that respond to crime um, must do more than capture and punish criminals. And that um, is from an article in the Criminal Justice Review by Gilbert and Settles, and I'll be using some of their information in this section. Um, so a little bit of an overview of what looking at um, restorative justice. And this is from Lauren Sauer. So when a harm is committed, um, the harm may reflect what's on the left of the screen, structural violence, um, prior harms that that person had experienced or unmet needs. And then what a harm creates is um, looking at who's responsible, who's been harmed, um, who's been affected both directly and indirectly. Um, restorative justice is not only looking at a victim or even a victim's family and the person who harmed, it's really looking at how it has um, kind of domino affected the rest of their community if they live in the same neighborhood or the same city, um, and then how that like breathes out into society. So parties that are typically directly and indirectly affected are obviously the individual and their family and loved ones, then their community. Then it goes out into the institution. So if it's in a school system or if it's in a church or if it goes into the criminal justice system, those are institutions that are typically involved. And then it also breathes into society. So, um, a couple more details about some of the foundational principles of restorative justice or RJ is that crime causes harm and justice should focus on repairing that harm. So our traditional justice system, um, Gilbert and Settles from that criminal justice review article says that these traditional approaches aren't working because they are only focusing on punishment of the guilty or the perceived guilty rather than um, turning their attention to the um, 
turning their attention to restoration for the victims and repairing harm. So that is um, one of the biggest qualms with traditional justice systems is that it's, it turns the attention away from really repairing the harm done and just focusing on punishment. Um, another thing is that people most affected by the crime should be able to participate in its resolution. Um, and this looks like um, in cases of capital punishment or the death penalty, um, which is things that I have a little more knowledge about just from my coursework, is um, they don't necessarily, the prosecution team um, doesn't really ask the victim's family what they would like to be seen done. Um, so in the case of um, and his crime was committed on Navajo land. And um, this was taken into a federal um, jury and federal um, court system. And the Navajo tribe is against capital punishment and they constantly um, have been advocating for him to be taken off death row because it's against their beliefs. Um, this also is the case in um, certain religious communities, so Quakers don't believe in violence, and um, many Catholics are against the death penalty as well, and so a lot of times there is um, not the account of um, what the victim or victim's family would want, so they're not a part of that process. And then the responsibility of the government is to maintain order and of the community is to build peace. And so what our government is doing in traditional forms of justice is they're not really addressing the um, quality of life in case it, oh, I'm, am I muted? Can y'all hear me? I'm so sorry. I'm just now seeing these. Yo, Ashley, yo. Ashley, it seems like occasionally you go mute, but it's it's only happened twice for a couple seconds. So I don't know why that's happening, but why don't you keep on going? So sorry. Um, Did you see that someone wanted you to go back to the definition of yeah. RJ? Okay. Um, I will go back to it right after I finish this. Um, so when the responsibility of the government is to maintain order and of the community is to build peace, is that um, traditional justice systems, like I was saying, don't address issues of quality in life in communities that are affected by crime. They're not trying to really address root problems. And um, in that criminal justice review, um, a couple of problems that are highlighted in typical street crime is that there are um, fewer families with health insurance. There are fewer grocery stores. There are open air drug markets. Um, education levels are lower and the government, rather than addressing those, just seek to punish um, people who commit crimes. So let's go back to the definition. So again, this is the definition and I'll reread it. Restorative justice is a theory of justice that emphasizes repairing the harm caused by criminal behavior. It is best accomplished through co cooperative processes that allow all willing stakeholders to meet. Although other approaches are available when that is impossible. This can lead to transformation of people, relationships, and communities. So restorative justice is really focused on repairing harm and giving um, all, all stakeholders, all, all people who are involved, access to exploring and um, it being in really open and intentional dialogue about the situation that has happened. So a few cornerstones um, 
there are four. Um, and this is all from the Restorative Justice Center. Um, so is inclusion of all parties. Everyone has to be involved um, because that is one of the problems with a traditional system of justice is it's really only focused on one side of um, a story and gaining um, what one party wants. And then encountering the other side. So really being in dialogue and discussion, making amends for the harm. And sometimes this looks like um, if it goes into the, the criminal justice system and the court system, it looks like um, prison sentencing. But if it's a lower crime level and if it involves youth, typically um, there's a lot of youth restorative justice diversion programs. Um, there's one in Nashville and it's called RAPHA. It's R-A-P-H-A-H. -H, and they have a program um, where they deal with they get sent um, youth from the court system and they deal with aggravated burglary, um, felony theft, theft of a vehicle, simple robbery, and auto burglary. Um, and so what happens is they get sent and they start in on a restorative justice process, but they ask, are you willing, right? Everyone has to be willing to make these amends and they bring in the person who was also involved if they're willing. And then it's reintegration of the parties into their communities. So they really try to make sure that these um, restorative justice programs and processes end with um, feeling confident in the fact that all parties are satisfied and feel heard so that they can go back to their communities and um, be better in the end, feel better and not feel um, separated. So um, it's gonna take us through the overview again. And then next, some common practices for how restorative justice work is that both parties must be completely willing to participate or all parties if there's more than two um, and that anyone can stop at any time. This means that you can um, take a quick break for a few days, or if you want to stop the process completely, you can do that too. Um, and if that happens, the process does stop completely on any side um, because if that willingness and that mutuality isn't there, a restorative justice process can't be effective. Um, it gives space to those who are harmed um, to ask questions that in a traditional justice system in our courts, they might not able, be able to ask um, because typically a survivor or a victim's family isn't really able to ask any questions. There's not a lot of contact um, between those who have been harmed and those who caused harm in a traditional justice sense. Um, and then it gives those who caused harm the opportunity to take accountability for said harm. Um, so in our traditional justice system, we see guilt, right? A, a jury decides guilt um, and someone can constantly be saying they're not innocent because they want to, or they are innocent because either they are and um, in a restorative justice process, um, if someone didn't commit a harm, they're not gonna just be there, right? It's, it's intentional and in knowing who caused the harm and making amends on that. Or they're pleading not guilty because they don't want to have a life in prison and they're, they're scared and stressed. And this gives the person who caused harm the responsibility to truly say, this is what I did. This is where I was in that. It's not excusing the harm, but it's giving reasons and explaining what's happening. So and then there's a third party involved to facilitate this discussion. Typically it's people who have been trained in the process through an organization or a program that is running. So um, this is a process chart. This is typically some of the questions that are asked um, either before a process of dialogue starts or during. Um, so it says, who was harmed is the first question. And you answer 
those who were directly harmed and indirectly harmed throughout this process. Um, so this is just an example, but, and then you ask what harms did they experience? And then you answer both directly and indirectly if there's indirect parties. Um, what are the needs as a result of these harms? What does that person need? How can those needs be addressed? What do we do right now? What is the next step to making amends? Who needs to address these harms? Who's responsible? What process might be used to address them? How can they make amends if it's a financial situation or if it was property damage or something like that? Um, and how should stakeholders be involved in this process? So that just means um, the people who um, might not have been directly harmed, um, but people in the community and um, in an institution, how might they be involved in this process to keep um, it moving forward? And then we're gonna watch a brief video. Um, if someone, when I start it, will make, will type in the chat if y'all can hear it, because that has been a problem on past Zooms I've been on. I'm thinking it'll work today, um, but this is just, um, talking more about restorative justice. More than half of victims of violent crime don't even call the police in the first place. They prefer nothing to everything we have to offer. The vast majority of crime survivors' pain goes unhealed. What the existence of restorative justice means is that we can no longer pretend we don't know what else to do. As a country, we're really good at punishment. It's passive. It doesn't require people to act, to think. It certainly doesn't require them to change. When we lock people up, we excuse them from their responsibility to answer for what they've done. Restorative justice is a process to hold them accountable. It's a tool. People take turns answering questions it's like, what happens? What needs arise? Whose responsibility is it to meet those needs? And how is that person going to do it? It requires someone to take responsibility, to repair things as much as possible, and to never commit that harm again. This isn't about feeling sorry. It's about doing sorry. Things like go to school, get a job, pay restitution, apologize, do community service. Restorative justice practices have been used to address low-level infractions like vandalism up to addressing the impact of murders on the surviving family members. Restorative justice processes are first and foremost about meeting the needs of people who are hurt. Sometimes the person who can make the greatest contribution to a survivor's healing is the person who harmed them. To come through trauma, we need answers to our questions to say, my life was never the same after you hurt me like that. Crime survivors want the most safety possibly available. So if incarceration actually produced safety, we would have the safest country in human history. That's not what we have. The core drivers of violence are shame, isolation, and inability to meet one's economic needs and exposure to violence. And we bake those into prisons to try and keep people from committing further violence. Incarceration exposes people to exactly the things that increase the likelihood that they'll go on to harm others. People who are hurt deserve a process that will help them heal. People who are responsible for crime have an obligation to be accountable for that. All of us deserve responses to crime that actually make us safer. Our current criminal justice system doesn't deliver any of those, and restorative justice at its best delivers them all. So let me get back to the presentation. Um, so, so sorry. <laughs> um, so that was just a brief video that I think really um, gives a good understanding as to um, what some of the, the needs that aren't being met within our current justice system can look like um, and how our prisons actually continue to facilitate. And that's why recidivism rates are so high. Um, is that there isn't actually um, 
growth or healing on any side. And so they're unable to um, really move on. And the culture within prisons is stemming from things that put people there in the first place as well. So here are a couple of benefits. Um, so these percentages are from a program in the UK, um, but we saw in that video that they said 98% of victim satisfaction within a youth diversion program. Um, this is 85. It goes um, that range though is typically in the mid 80s to the high 90s through separate programs because restorative justice programs keep their own data because depending on where they're located, how they run, it's going to be a little different. Um, but basically, this is just a chance to be heard and to hear others. Um, it's to not feel pacified or ignored by the justice system on any side, but particularly the ones who have been harmed. Um, a lot of times in cases of capital punishment, for example, um, it says that the state actually takes on the role of the, the victim. Um, so it's like the state of Tennessee versus X or the United States versus um, whoever. And so that automatically takes away some of the agency of um, the victim's family and um, kind of creates a, a space between them getting justice in how they would see fit. So this is just another chart by Lauren Sauer, and it says um, it's for naming justice needs, so what people need out of a restorative justice process. Um, and so obviously it's that same set of stakeholders, the individual, the family, the community, society and institutions, um, and then around are some reasons why they need justice and what they need justice for and what that looks like for them. So just some examples, um, if it's hard to read, are to be forgiven or to forgive, um, to be held responsible, um, truth telling, to express sorrow or grief in certain cases, um, engagement, safety, um, to feel empathy, um, to be constructive, um, and empowerment as well. So um, I'm going to stop sharing for a little bit as I talk and we'll come back to the last point. Um, but I would say that um, a lot of people think that mediation and restorative justice are one and the same. Um, and among restorative justice programs, they actually debate that as well. Um, but what some people say about the difference in mediation and restorative justice is that it's different because restorative justice is asking restorative questions, and such as, what has happened? Who has been impacted or harmed? And what can we do to make it better? And there are also scripts sometimes that programs will follow to make sure they stay on um, guided questions to make sure that they're really focusing on repairing harm. And then in mediation, it's typically between two equal parties. Um, there's not necessarily an overt case of harm. And um, a Sussex um, Restorative Justice Partnership said, that that's the biggest difference. In restorative justice, there is clear harm, and in mediation, there isn't harm or it might be more nuanced. I'm gonna take a second and look at some of these questions. Um, would you say that restorative justice could tie? Yes, um, so the question is, would you say that restorative justice could tie into police reform and the full continuum of policing and restoring humans? Yes, is the, the quick answer, but I would say I've really started to research this tie because of what our country has been going through and is um, in the middle of right now in looking at police brutality and police reform. Um, restorative justice is designed to make sure that harm is repaired, right? I've said that a ton of times already. And so in situations of um, police brutality or just reform, um, it's the same situation. 
looking at what police systems have done to cause harm to individuals or communities and looking at how to truly make amends. And so if you were to do that in a restorative justice lens, it would be having parties from both police units and systems and higher ups and also having those in the communities that have been affected. So whether that is a family member of someone who has been affected by police brutality all the way up to just community members and leaders um, in as many aspects as they want. So it could be a long process, but I believe that restorative justice um, really addresses the harm and makes it a collaboration rather than just deeming someone as evil. <laughs> um, <clears throat> sorry, deeming someone as evil or bad um, when in reality it's, you know, systems that, that are doing that harm and people are living into those. And so I think that restorative justice would be incredible for that. Um, and I would be happy to follow up with you on more because there's articles out there on how to tie the two together. Um, and the next question from Richmond is many of the examples involve financial restitution. What is the path when the crime is committed by a desperate person with no resources to provide financial restitution? That's a very good question um, because we see um, like in cases of youth being involved, youth as the, the ones who caused harm. Say it's a case of youth vandalism. Um, they, they messed up a building. They painted something on the side of someone's building. They found out who it was and they started this restorative justice process. While they might not be able to pay to have it painted, um, they themselves can do the painting. They can, they can provide um, labor in the sense to make amends. And um, typically there are um, programs within the restorative justice programs to help if it's a financial situation, um, figure out alternatives because people can't always pay for damages, right? They can't, if they stole someone's car and wrecked it, they might not have the financial means to replace that car. Um, but what a lot of people are looking for in situations like that is more of questions to answers um, and understanding where that person was from um, and adopting the restorative justice concept. Um, sorry, I lost it. And yes, the various disciplines needed to address harm. That's true. Good, good point, Lauren. Um, so what is our region and denomination doing to bring restorative justice usage into our legal system? So that's a good point. <laughs> um, that's a good answer. And I'm going to go back to sharing our screen as to why we should care as Christians about this and what are some examples that we could bring restorative justice into our denomination as a whole um, and make that kind of a tenant for us. Because um, some people kind of ask a question of, well, why, you know, why would it matter? I'm not the one committing crimes. I'm not even, I don't even work in the criminal justice system. Um, and there's a lot of scripture based things as to why this will matter to us. And then I'll get to answering your question more specifically, Jerry. Um, but I thought this was a good bridge. So in Isaiah 61, and the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and to release the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all those who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion. Um, next is from the Gospel of Matthew. Um, and it's the Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? 
And the king will answer them, truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. I think this one is telling of restorative justice as a whole because it's talking about meeting the needs, not only talking about when people are imprisoned, but when they're hungry, when they're naked, doing things to um, bring their quality of life up and taking care and bringing justice to them truly. Um, Hebrews 13, let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them. Those who are being tortured as though you were He has told you, O oh mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. And lastly is from Lamentations, when all the prisoners of the land are crushed underfoot, when human rights are perverted in the presence of the Most High, when one's case is subverted, does the Lord not see it? So these are a few of um, the um, examples of scripture. Captivity, prisoners, um, and justice are mentioned dozens upon dozens of times in the Bible, that specific language. Um, and so what we can do as a region or as a denomination is instill restorative justice programs or practices um, in our common churches, right? So restorative justice doesn't need to necessarily be a case of a criminal act. Um, it can just be used in conflict. There's a TED Talk by Dr. Shannon Silva on um, restorative justice and how it could end mass incarceration, but she talks about if we were to just use it in cases of conflict, this process and how it looks, um, it would make us all actually better because a lot of time we do what the justice system does and we just, we just shove a problem away or we just lock it up and don't really think about it if we have it with someone that maybe we're uncomfortable having a dialogue with. And so a restorative justice practice would be, um, for example, I work with youth a lot, is taking a couple youth who have had some issues and gaining them with the permission of their parents, um, but sitting them down and asking, what, what's happening? Why are you, you know, if it's talking badly about each other or um, shunning someone from a group at youth or at camp or something, it's um, saying, why are you causing harm? Naming the harm that you're causing, because sometimes youth particularly don't really see it as harm. Um, addressing what needs to be done to amend that harm and then making sure it's followed through. So that would be taking youth pastors or um, youth mentors or people who are involved in that program and helping them hold youth accountable because they sometimes need a little more help, a little boost and making sure that they're staying um, true to what they're, they're promising. So that's an example, but also that can be done with regular church members. Um, there's a lot of topics that people disagree on within a church. Um, and sometimes words do cause harm or an action causes harm or a decision. And really taking notice as clergy or leadership um, and um, connecting that into a, into a restorative justice process and, and bringing those people in and saying, we really need to talk about this because um, this is butterfly effect going and spreading through to more of the congregation. So I think um, kind of either getting trained in restorative justice processes or um, just kind of understanding how to lead a conversation such as this would really help um, both regionally and denominationally is I would, it would be a dream to start a restorative justice <laughs> program within our denomination. Um, 
So yes, and I'm gonna go back to looking at some of the questions. Oh, I went mute again, man. Um, yes, I will share the slides. Um, and I'll have um, someone from the regional office uh, send that presentation out to y'all because they have all of your emails. Um, also, do you have, You have Tennessee statewide leadership. I do not have that. <laughs> I wish I did. <laughs> um, you might want to discuss what it would look like when the community. When it is the, mm. Yes. Okay. So that's a really good question is when restorative justice could be um, looked into on like looking at systems that cause harm rather than an individual. And um, what I would say is it can be done. Typically restorative justice is kept on a more in interpersonal level. Um, but what I would say that would look like is typically finding community leadership um, from the, the systems that have or are still causing harm um and but they the really tricky thing is they have to be willing and that's where things can get um messier than normal is a lot of people who sit in positions of power that are are causing harm are either ignoring it because they're still in power um or they're unaware and they aren't listening um to what's happening or they pretend to be oblivious <laughs> to what's happening um so the where that would become harder is the fact that they have to be willing to see that through as well. Um, so we have seen a lot of people starting to really um, take notice of what's going on, um, but then not listening to um, what amends are wanted. And that's when um, that willingness goes out the door because they're like, well, I, I know I'm taking notice. That's a that's a step. And you're like, yes, but to follow through and in a restorative justice process is not only acknowledging it, but discussing it and making amends. And so to do all of that on a community scale would be um, harder because there are more components at play. There are more people involved um, that would be unwilling. So that's what I would um, say about that. I wish it, I hope one day that that could be used on such a grand scale. Um, but even when we see, uh, I mentioned Lesman Mitchell, he's on um, the list to be executed by the federal government quite soon. Um, he, it, I hope I mentioned this, if I didn't, he's a member of the Navajo tribe and his crime was committed on Navajo land on a reservation and he was arrested and tried by the federal government and given the death penalty. Um, so the Navajo community and leadership have been calling for for his capital punishment to be repealed because they don't they don't believe in that and it was on Navajo land but the system that is causing this discrepancy is not listening they're not willing to be in a process of truly understanding where they're coming from and what they're asking um, because they are narrow focus and um, pretty intentionally ignorant of the fact that they don't, the Navajo tribe doesn't respect um, the death penalty. They don't, they don't believe in it. So they're too focused on what justice is than actually looking at what justice is in this situation for this tribe. Um, many of these excellent concepts seem to link to the and tenants of Mr. Bell. I would say yes. So um, like a 12 step program um, where you make amends, I think they are very similar and they can go hand in hand if someone's working through a 12 step program or through um, AA or NA, um, they definitely would be um, maybe able easier to take responsibility if they're at that step so that they can, they can truly be in dialogue with the people that they caused harm to. Um, yes, sorry. It says, many of these excellent concepts seem to link to AA and the tenants of Mr. Bill, yes or no? My apologies. Um, 
And so I would say yes, because making amends is definitely one of the steps in and accepting responsibility and accountability. Um, does anyone have any other questions? I have a couple um, of ways that we can get involved in what um, looking at restorative justice is, especially because um, also for youth, um, like I said, I work with them a lot. I work at um, through Bethany Hills and um, my job at my church is to work with youth. And so there's things that youth can do to get educated about this, right? They can sit through a workshop like this. They can go through a class in which they become um, trained in a restorative justice process, just like any adult could. Someone could come in to a youth or when we can have regional assembly in person, they could come in and, and teach a youth class on a model of um, restorative justice dialogue. Um, but ways that we as adults um, can get involved is getting trained in, it's called victim offender mediation or dialogue, um, which is just the process. Um, peacemaking circles, um, I got trained in circle, uh, and it's called peacemaking circles. I got trained in that this past year and it's just another restorative act. Um, and it's super holy. It is a beautiful space to be in circle is what it's called. And you can be in circle for hours um, where it's just a way to talk about harms you've experienced, work through things as a group, collaborate. Um, there's people who can lead those. Um, there's some in Nashville I know, um, and there's people all over the country who can do that. And so they could come in for a church setting or a youth setting if you want maybe your leadership of your church, your deacons and elders to be trained in circles and have those a few times throughout the years for people who happening can you can you hear me okay cool sorry <laughs> um can these trainings be done virtually um yes i believe so um there's a circle building institute in nashville everyone went frozen so i'm i'm unsure hold on Okay, everyone unfroze, sorry. <laughs> um, I might still be frozen, but if y'all can't hear me anymore, just message and let me know. Um, there are peace building and circle training institutes. And so I'm sure during, um, especially during times of COVID, um, they are probably more willing to do virtual. The thing about circle training specifically is you sit in circle for hours um, to kind of learn on the first day and then you get trained specifically on the second day so that might be a little difficult on zoom because like actually being in a circle is very pertinent to this training and the way it's conducted um, but i know i'm sure with um, victim offender mediation and such you could definitely do that training virtually and then um looking at what true restitution means so um, being involved in that on a youth level is getting involved in community activism and, and learning what people are needing restitution for. And um, I think that's learned best through um, where your community is. So whatever city you're in, there are, there are issues that need to be addressed. And so working with that. And then community service. Again, um, restorative ju justice also looks at the quality of life. Um, in a neighborhood or in a city or community. And so doing acts of service and helping the place you are rather than maybe going somewhere else. So doing a mission week of being in your city or a weekend um, and doing something to help improve um, the spaces around you and just improving that quality of life. Um, does sort of justice attempt to identify and address a root cause or should it? So yes. It definitely can and does a lot of the time. Um, it 
So the point of having all parties involved is you can have someone who has had unmet needs for their entire life and has endured a lot of trauma. And so part of what a restorative justice process can look like is focusing in that moment on the harm that has been done to the survivor or the victim in this case, but then going back and saying, oh, you need restoration too. All of these things that happened to you, you, um, you know, you endured childhood trauma, you um, have a drug addiction, you, all of these things and addressing those and providing restoration to those root causes. So I think it definitely can and it does in a lot of sense. sense. Um, but if it doesn't in some programs, I think it should and it will evolve into that. I think I might have missed a question. Um, Jim Easter, yes, I can. I will be in contact with you. <laughs> Is empathy training a potential tool for offenders, perhaps meeting and learning who their victim was? Yes. Um, so I'll speak on this from the lens of me being inside on Tennessee's death row unit. Um, these men actually went through a lot of mediation training, a lot of um, practices in which they had to really become connected to their emotions, which a lot of them hadn't been, and um, really thinking about who they had caused harm to. So the tricky part is, especially if a person is incarcerated, is a lot of times they might not able, be able to contact their, um, the person they harmed or their family. So I know in the case on um, the death row unit at Riverbend is they cannot make contact with the victim's family. Um, and so, and, and a lot of times um, it's kind of mutual that way. Like they try to prevent um, a family from reaching out to them as well, um, which is again, because they're not focused on bringing true um, res restoration to um, both parties. And so a lot of times, if it does go into the justice system and they're in the, our prison industrial complex, they are unable to really meet and learn about who their, who their victim was and who was um, on the other end of their harm. And that's where restorative justice should be <laughs> the, the way our system works, is because if they do that, then they, there would be healing in, in a much um, deeper way for people because some people think that um, just sending someone to prison is justice. And if that's what someone needs for amends to happen, that's a conversation. But some people just um, want more out of that system and it's not being given. Is there, is there the music? Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I really um, admire prison chaplains. <laughs> I thought I wanted to be one for the last year and then that got um, blown up in my face for, for a reason. But that is really good to know. Um, and I would love to maybe figure out how to, to do this on a wide scale and continue this conversation because we are almost out of time. Um, but so if y'all are interested, I'm going to put my email um, down in the chat. Um, and if y'all are interested in continuing this conversation or starting or having another event through the region, um, email me and we can work with the region and maybe get something set up. Um, or if you just want to know more, have any more questions. Um, but before we close, does anyone have any last questions they want to get in? Thank you all for working with my technology challenges. <laughs> I apologize for randomly muting. I don't know what was happening. <laughs> well, thank y'all. Um, again, if you ever have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, I am truly happy to talk about this process and this topic at any time. Um, also, if you're, you have some sort of interest in capital punishment, I can also talk about that all the time. Um, it's a really near and dear conversation in my heart. Um, I, I had a friend who was executed in February that I met through my class. Um, so restorative justice and what that could mean for our justice system is super important. 
So thank you all so much.